Hello and welcome back to another music podcast with me, Harry Chris Robin, and as always, my co-host, Jazz Boy Fuck I Gone. Continuing to not bleep that. Um, it's been a, it's it's been a while uh, since we um, since we did a last episode. A lot has happened. So much has happened since I last saw you. Lost my hammer like yesterday. So mm. that's pretty fresh. No, sorry, <sighs> wrong, wrong. Um, so what's happened? The Queen died. Oh shit! Yeah, we've got a Liz Truss. Oh. Editor Harry here. Um, th- the following day after recording this podcast, Liz Truss resigned as PM or Prime Minister of the UK. So that kind of just shows how quickly politics moves sometimes and how out of date things can go very quickly. So that's a nice bit of information for you. Back to the podcast. Unfortunately, I Liz Truss think that you Liz Truss should resign as Prime Minister. Bring on a general election. But we're here to talk about music, music, music. But in in true tradition, as we've already set up a tradition on our podcast, uh, we're only going to talk about Muse. Yeah. <laughs> seems to be the thing these days. It Se- seems to be the theme. I think, well, Matt, you and I are big, big Muse fans, and it's going to be a while. I th- it might take a lot for us to kind of stray away from it. One day we will do something oh, we'll other get than there. Muse. We'll get there. We'll get there. We'll get there. There's just a lot to get through. Muse have you know, got a lot to offer. Today's episode is going to concern the, a discussion around our Muse still hitting as hard as they used to upon release. Mm. There is a better way to say that. Okay, what about, uh, do Muse still hit hard? Yeah, do Muse still hit hard? Um, kind of like, I guess in some ways, I guess you could, maybe it covers a bit of relevancy. Like, are they still relevant? Um and what, I had another great... Th- oh, and I remember, actually, this, this whole video, this whole video, this whole podcast could almost be considered a, res- a response to um, that person who commented on the last episode we did where they were like, oh, I hate this album. I wonder if you guys will still like it in a few months' time. So maybe we can go over a bit of the whole Will of the People vibe and what their live shows have been like and whether we think, actually, yeah, we still like it or actually, no, nah, that comment was right, it's shit. Yeah, I I very much do want to cover that. I've got I've got some uh, interesting points. I th- well, you and I privately we've kind of spoken about it, but I think we're going to really dive into it. Mm. Um, but before we get to that stage, I think we um, we've not scripted any. Well, not, we don't script, but we haven't planned anything because we're going to try and do this off the cuff. I would suggest now, Matt, you can chime in with this. I would suggest we kind of establish, you know, early muse in terms of like how for. For, from only from our perspective, how much they, how big they would hit back then yes. to, you know, as time goes on. Um, so I, I, I would suggest we try and maybe we do that quite quickly. So we start with showbiz, you know, new, new boys from Devon on, onto the scene uh, and kind of ex- explode in, in a way, um, do questionable looking music videos. Leaning into that um, grunge rock popularity yeah with, with with obviously elements of radio like their first album you can really hear the radiohead influence it's just i production can't thing oh really interesting no i i've heard this for years people have always said oh Muse sounds so much like radiohead especially like being you know, back in the day i was like i really can't hear it one because it was like i you know we listened to a lot of radiohead mm. as, a, as a kid as a kid and then kind of as, as i got older i was like he's still listening to it so it really solidified as that is the quintessential Radiohead. Like, it's really hard for me to separate it out. Then listen to Mm. a lot of Muse, and it's like, to me, they're so distinct. They've got their own sound. It really is... I really can't hear a a Radiohead kind of-esque vibe. For me, it's because... Yeah, because it's like, I mean, if if I'm talking as a musician, there really isn't that much similarity at all between Showbiz and very early Radiohead. But what it is that's kind of... But I think people hear and then they automatically go, oh, that's that's Radiohead or whatever. Some of the guitar tones he uses in the first album are very, very reminiscent of things that I hear on the bends. Literally, all I'm hearing in my head is um, uh, the very... In- What's the song that starts off with like... Bow, bow, jigga, jigga, bow, 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 jigga, bow, 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 Dow, the not Radiohead. That's a Muse song from Showbiz. Oh, uh, Overdue. Yeah, yeah. That that's the one song where I can really kind of understand it a bit. But other than that, I think it's just that they're similar timbres, and so people are like, oh, they've got similar sounds, so they must be the same. Oh, is that really? Is that what it really might be? I mean, because I think to me that sounds dumb and redactive. 
but that's that's what people are like when it comes to music because p- people uh, hear me sing in a high voice people hear any dude sing in a high voice and go you sound like Matt Bellamy and it's like oh well done yes thank you I, oh, yeah, yes, as, as, as we all know Matt Bellamy the inventor of the falsetto yeah well yes of course <laughs> Jeff Buckley who uh, yeah um, <laughs> but uh, Bee Gees what um, but yeah that was, I think that was it like and because I remember seeing an interview with them back in like 2002 or something and someone was saying mm. Um, do you do you agree with the criticism that newborn just sounds like a new version of Bohemian Rhapsody? And I was like, what the fuck are people talking about? Like it, that's such, bo- and it's purely because it starts with the piano and then goes into a riff. That that's it. And people are like, Is oh, that, I, that, that's the that's, only thing I can think of. Like that's so reductive. Yeah, that's, that's so. It. That's the industry oh. <laughs> and the way people consume shit. And they're like, oh yeah. Well, <laughs> well next on our journalist music music journalistic podcast yeah <laughs> wow that well i i feel very confident and happy in myself that i've never seen that that similarity because mm. i was racking my brain thinking what am i missing why is everyone thinking radiohead and it just seems to be surface level approaches to it interesting so um Moving away, uh, 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 you know, Muse never took over the world with Showbiz. It's, no, it's a fine, it's a fine album, but it, it's not. It's never going to re- redefine anything. Um, then Origin of Symmetry comes along, kind of like changes the game. You know, we got Plug It Baby, we got Bliss, we got Newborn. You know, big, big singles, big singles with big riffs. You know, got a lot of stage presence. That for, from very early on, they were already kind of known for being kind of a live type band. Mm. And as I've seen in interviews and so on, they wanted to capture that live feeling in Origin of Symmetry and it went down really well, both in the original version and then even more so in the Origin X, the, our anniversary version that came out last year. Um, and then, you know, kind of, you know, that helped kind of establish them as like a big kind of serious thing more and more. And the absolution, I'm, I'm really flying through it. Yeah, uh, but I think if, if you want to slow one. down, yeah, yeah. if you want to, if, if you want to slow down, absolution is where it really started to come into mm. their own. One, to prove that Origin of Symmetry wasn't just a fluke. Yeah. Um, but then we've kind of, we, we've moved into kind of the vibe that Origin of Symmetry had to this kind of like dark bit with kind of flares of like big big sounds but then absolution really turned that up to the nines um openers of like in terms of musically openers from like apocalypse please is like the perfect song to open the album from to really set the scene and then as you wind through you've got all sorts of dynamic range changes for you know um taking it down to falling away with you back up to hysteria down to with blackout but then as you kind of scale up with it when the fuzz comes in the madness that is butterflies and hurricanes uh, and then kind of rounding it all off with uh, Ruled by Secrecy. But a brilliant way to end the album and the bookends of the album with uh, Apocalypse Players and Ruled by Secrecy is the perfect combination for it. Mm. And then they had a really successful tour off of it. You know, obviously the highlights for, for me, for my view for, Abs- for the Absolution tour were Glastonbury and Earl's Court gig. Um, uh, and there was, you know, there's some other good ones, you know, between that. But I'd say those are the two massive ones. Like they said, um, Glastonbury was their biggest gig, best gig at the time mm. that they that they'd done at that point. Sadly, Dom's dad died <laughs> hours later. It kind of puts a, a, a real downer on yeah, on that. That is whole, a real downer. Uh, I just always find that quite funny for some reason. Like it's not 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 that fact in itself. Just the fact that everyone knows that that's a fact. I find quite funny, like morbidly funny. Yeah, yeah dark yeah. humor. Yeah, yeah, I know exactly yeah. what you mean. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I think one thing I want to say before we move on to like, um, the difference, well, maybe this is the difference between the, cause I feel like black, uh, black holes is where they started to move into slightly poppier territory, um, yep. still with a lot of their rock roots, but I think what started to change from black holes, or maybe you could say resistance onwards was that what kind of made them stand out in their early days, like showbiz and origin was um kind of like the fact that they were kind of genre bending and like they weren't really stuck to oh we're just a rock band because they might have like a classical aria or something in the middle of their tracks and i think what's different now which may be like affecting the way muse are received is that everyone does that now like it's not or it's very it's a lot easier for artists to genre bend and do like crazy stuff like that now and it's not as unique to alternative rock musicians like Muse. I very much agree. Mm. Um, you know, back then um, we weren't seeing, ma- uh, 
in kind of like the early noughties kind of side of things, we weren't seeing massive mashups of like genres or, you know, genre defying or genre escaping type music. Um, and they really helped do that. I think for me, when I started listening to them in kind of mid to late 2005, that's how, that's how long ago, um, mm-hmm. that kind of, that was what really drew me to them because they were doing so much with just three dudes. Yeah. And I was like, wow. Um, and, and that's what kind of really blew me away from it. And then I guess part of the kind of the, the, the worry about it, which we might get allude to earlier, later or, or move on to is that I guess there's only so far you can really take that approach mm. really thoughts. Yeah. Well, I guess what you could, you mention the three piece thing as well is um, that's like muse of, been around and this is not a criticism because i mean fucking if you can do it why not but i'm sure other bands yes. like rolling stones have experienced this and queen or what's left of queen might still experience this now muse get to experience it where they've been around so long that now other bands and artists are coming up into the stratosphere so to speak who are the continuation and the evolution of what they started because they were inspired by Muse. I'm thinking about bands like Nothing But Thieves and Royal Blood. And so yeah, now yeah. even that Muse they- sound <laughs> is no longer completely unique. Yeah. Um, I, you kind of like stole the words out of my mouth in terms of bands specifically Nothing But Thieves and mm. Royal Blood are baby Muse. Yeah. Like Nothing But th- I mean, I mean th- but it's weird you call them baby muse and they sound so different from each other but because they've kind of taken the elements of it. Um uh what's his um what's his name? The singer from, from Nothing But Thieves, his name has just gone out of my head. I oh, I used to it. know I used to be more of a fan of them than I am now, purely because I've just not yeah. listened to them for a long time. <laughs> Yeah, so but he he kind of very much took up uh, that you can tell you can hear him using the music, but also more specifically with Jeff Buckley. Mm. Um, but then with Royal Blood, it's like a mashup. To me, it sounds like a mashup between Muse and Queens of the Stone Age. Yeah, you've got kind of more of the aggressive Queens vocals and some of the Queens harmonies. But I with... think it's because Josh Hom produced Royal Blood. Oh, well, that helps. Yeah, that it. would help. It, that yeah. helps with it. But it's like. You got those two, to me, undeniable elements. I guess that's a bit ironic since earlier I just said I listen to me so much that I can only hear them as them, but then other bands, I guess that come from them. Yeah. Have adopted that sound. It's different. I think it's... It's, it's chicken hard. and egg thing. Yeah, I think... And it's hard as well because, like, we've mentioned before in other episodes of the podcast that Muse are kind of notorious for ripping off other bands to an extent, but even when they do do that, they still sound like themselves kind of thing like it could be a let's say a marilyn manson riff um but it still (laughs) sounds like a muse song even though the the melodic or harmonic content has been taken from somewhere else they've still managed to make it work Mm. yeah Uh, it it it, it, it's interesting kind of how music will evolve and speaking of, of evolve you know let's let's now look at Black holes, the coming off of the success of Absolution, really coming to their own. Mm. As you know, more po- more poppy elements, but are making them a bit more accessible. Um, still riding high, did some you know amazing shows on the Black Holes tour. You know, Wembley, you know, boom, huge yeah, show. Yeah, that was a big one. Um, and then uh, swiftly moving on to Resistance. So I think you've made the argument that's their most successful album. I think that's yeah. I think that's maybe. Oh shit! I just nearly broke everything, but with my foot, that would have been bad. <laughs> Don't break everything. I live. I live on this planet. <laughs> yeah, I was just I nearly pressed the button, but it's all good. It's all good. Yeah. Um, so, resistance. Yeah, like I think that's my favorite album. Um, yeah, still my favorite. As although one of the people is really good. Um, I think that's. I think that's so funny that that's your favorite album, and that's my least favorite. I album. know it's really weird, isn't it? How it's like, so interesting. How like how that is a fact <laughs> mm. between us as big fans and as we get on really well on this on this discussion uh, i think that's so funny um yeah it's weird isn't it and I, I think when we went into the whole discussion we kind of figured out that it's not necessarily that i think it's the best album it's just that i vibe with it and the yeah. the what's it called the nostalgia of it because it was like the first it was the one that was out when I first started to get into Muse kind of thing um, yeah but yeah I think Resistance you could say was probably the top of their creative drives if I don't know how to phrase this because once they got to the second law 
it started to be more about the ideas behind the album rather than the music in the album itself. As in, Second Law was, let's just make an album full of singles. Drones was, what if we make an album like we did when we were younger? Simulation Theory was, what if we make an album that's based in the 80s and it's all kind of based on this idea of simulated 80s sounds? And then Will of the People is, um, I guess, their greatest hits. So again, whilst the music's better in Will of the People, it's still not made from the perspective of they've got music that they want to put out. It's more, we should put an album out, what's the theme kind of thing. I, that, yeah. Um, yeah, pretty much with you on that. Uh, yeah, it's, I think, well, we said it when we did the, um, the album review in terms of it's very much like a, you know, a best of muse, but not like by song, it's more like by style. Mm. Um, which I think was an interesting angle from them. You know, they, they'd never done that before. Muse always trying to do something they hadn't done before. You can't, you, know, I, you can't not applaud them for that. Mm. Um, and I think, I think it's, you know, it's really good, it's really powerful, but then, uh, it, some, uh, maybe they shouldn't have relied on it. Uh, but that's alluding to the discussion later in terms of where the album stands. To me, for me, personally, um, Resistance is where things started to go downhill. Now, See, but I can of, also agree with you there, which is weird. Yeah, I think because it's, it's your because, favourite album. Yeah, because I think, although it's my favourite, and um, all the stuff I've said before, I think it, I can still see that and this is maybe why it might be my favourite, is their ego started to go a little bit mental because they were like, oh, let's produce it ourselves and we'll do it in our own studio. Mm. And it's all, yeah, kind of me, me, me kind of thing. Yeah, that, that that's the thing that I got a real problem with, with mm. Resistance. Um, you know, the fact that they self-produced it. Um, in, in theory, I've got nothing wrong with it. You know, you want to have more control, you know, experiment with it. But they, the fact that they just went in on their own from the beginning, it was like, that's dangerous territory in terms yeah. of like... And it, like, it's, if it goes wrong, it sounds crap. It's like your fault. And as I said, too many songs. There were too many negatives, really, with the album. Not to say that I don't like it. There's some bangers on there, like you know, MK Ultra is like you know, well up there in terms of like really good songs. But then, unfortunately, it's you know, followed by I Belong to You and mm-hmm. very weird, very it, weird. It, it, it's it, it like, but I completely understand what you mean by you know, musically. It, they, they really pushed that envelope, you know, Exogenesis, which mm. is what we didn't cover in, in the review because that does deserve its own, oh, yeah, its own yeah. entire, oh, entire episode in terms of like what's going on in there. The instrumentation, the actual, the concept behind it, that was a great little kind of like, you know, concept right there to do, like mm. a mini concept. Easy to um, put out there and because, you know, it was Exogenesis part one, two and three, it's really easy to kind of keep that thing going. Um, cross-pollination, uh, part two, which is is my favourite one, really kind of speaks to that theme, you know, the most. Uh, but that and like really pushing it out of there, I just don't think the production did the music justice. Mm. And in in music, you know, as you know, we, you know, I both make make music. Um, you, you kind of need both for it to really hit hard. You can have the best written song, but if you've you know recorded it with a microphone two miles away from the sound source, for example, taking it to extremes, mm, mm. it ain't going to sound good. No one's going to want to listen to it. Yeah. Like I said, like the, the guitar tone for the riff for Uprising is just, for me, the wrong sound. Yeah. And it really, it deflates it. It's like, yes, it's a good song, but it's so deflated. Um, I think Matt Bellamy would probably agree with you for some of the songs. I think that's probably why he's he, he doesn't enjoy playing Resistance live as much. And I wonder if it was produced by another person or with help from a producer, whether the art finished product would therefore make the song pop off in the way that he imagined it would. Yeah, I think uh, well because we had Origin our anniversary release, you know, you know, to remix the whole album. Uh, I think despite the fact that I want an absolution treatment for that, I think Resistance deserves another stab. Oh, I'd love that. <laughs> uh, just because I, you know, I, because I said musically, it's got some amazing things on in there. They could do I a full they, orchestra recording of Exogenesis, like creating new parts right? and stuff. Oh my god! Oh. Right, <laughs> or just like you know, or like just reamp guitars, you know, mm. really thicken out the, the production on the. Because oh, I, I, I'd be, more, I'd advocate more for like a remix rather than like re-record. Yeah, you know, yeah like yeah. they did, like what they did with Origin. Um, you know, to still capture that feel, but like you know, let's actually m- make it sound good. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I because you know, I I believe in the album. I believe it sounds musically fine. Production could be could do a lot better, and I think a remix would do that 
do that well. My point, going in, circling back to the theme of this, is that, as I said, like, that's when things started to spiral down. Yes, they may be getting too much into the ego. Yes, they're going a bit too far away from what this is what not not just because this isn't what the fans want but more from the angle of um they've come a, they've come too far away from their home base their comfort zone to really kind of play around with stuff in there coming coming out of your comfort zone is always a good thing but i think they'd gone too far by the time they got to second law it had shown that right they are on a weird trajectory um i think uh, i think objectively second law is a Le- as is a less good album compared to Resistance, but Resistance just kind of set the set the stone set the set the trend for it. Like mm. Survival is a weird one, and the Prelude thing that they still continue to play live weird, it freaks bothers me so it, much. That they play Starlight after it. It's like yeah, play it bothers me Survival. <laughs> and then um, Follow Me, which no one talks about anymore. I actually, you know, I want them to bring that back. Like, I don't know, it, it really wouldn't work with their the current album's vibe and how they usually do set lists. But I would like to see that be performed at least once more. Like, <laughs> yeah, maybe. But I, I think my, what, the, one of the highlights, there's, I think for me, there's like two highlights in the album. Uh, Animals and Big Freeze. Well, what about Liquid, no, Liquid State? State's really good and so is Unsustainable. Um, <laughs> um, but like animals is it, it's so good. Mm. It it like it doesn't. Uh, it's like it almost doesn't deserve to be uh, like put with the album. And then Big Freeze is great. I think partly because it's never been played live. Partly because it's got that kind of U two sound, which you know they hadn't done before. Great tone, really fun solo, really massive chorus. Like it's like a lot of effort went into kind of like writing and recording that. Why didn't I'm they a play real it? Real sucker. That with Big Freeze, I'm a real sucker for the drums on it, man. Like I, I don't know mm. whether it's because they're genuinely slightly better than everything else on the album, or if it's just because of that clip that was released from when they were recording it <laughs> of Dom just being like. Bruh, bruh, cap, bruh. Cat! And I'm just like, oh, it's so fucking like big sounding. I love it. Like, yeah, no, no, I, I think I think that's it. I think that's the reason why. I think I think that's great. It's it's just too good. Mm. Uh, I I often wondered why watching while watching the um the making of the album, why is it just Dom and Chris, you know, and and Rich or whoever it is that's the, the producer? Where's Matt during that? Was he just having an off day? I've heard that, um, I can't remember what, inter- I think it was like an interview with an old mix engineer for Muse or something, someone who's worked with them for a few years or whatever. And um, he said that there would often be, well, not often, but there would be days where Dom and Chris would be laying down the bass and the drum parts or whatever, and Matt Bellamy would be recording the vocals upstairs in the second studio room, because obviously he likes to do that alone. And then they'd kind of come down around lunchtime and kind of swap things around and be like, oh, how's that gone? Yeah, let's listen to that kind of thing. So I reckon that was probably what was happening there. But I kind of like that energy of just like Uh, Dom and Chris just being like, yeah, man, do a good take, yeah. Yeah. No, no, I I like that. Yeah, because we we, we never hear from Chris. Mm. I mean, he goes, he just goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, the, or that bit where Dom's slagging him off going, use the talk back, use the talk back. And Chris is just like bumbling yeah. his way into the control room. <laughs> it's, it's like, I all right, that. Dom, steady on. It's got, it's such, it's such chaotic energy, <laughs> such sassy energy. Taking up, so in terms of the anal- analysis, what's what, um, with the albums there, let's, let's pause with the second law and, and look at resistance. So like we've got two albums that I've kind of, gone off the rails in direction in terms of like production they've kind of doing their own thing and it's starting to deflate that overall muse sound you know during the album you, you know with it with listening to it you kind of absorbed in the excitement of it but um it's it's definitely deflated like sonically like the sound has come away from it that's pulling the excitement out of like you know wanting to you know experience muse and so on you know live they've still got it but it's you know people will most consumers will just listen to the album fast forward then on to drones where it really picked up i would i would say production you know production wise because they brought in a producer Mm -hmm. you know they kind of i'd say they kind of like realized where they kind of kind of got a bit wrong with the previous efforts and i think it really paid off 
It was the guy for AC, who produced ACDC, right? Yeah, Matt Lang, more legend. Matt Lang, and it, and it, and and it really showed. I mean, a lot of people don't like Drones. I think it's a fine album. No, I'm not going to do like a song analysis of it quick, but it's, it's more like it really picked up. It's got that. It's got a lot more of a. Uh, an obvious concept to it so read the album really came out swinging really strong sound the album the songs flowed into each other it really picked up that's you know uh, uh, what would you say to that um anything yeah i i think with drones um some people like really loved it because it it did feel a bit like and i mean whether you like the overall sound at the end of it or not they did kind of record it as a three piece in a room kind of thing so mm. it was a nice kind of tread back to what the three musicians from showbiz would do with like where they're at now kind of thing. It was like an, going back to an approach that they would have done before. So that was kind of cool. Um, but I still think um, like in that kind of, uh, hmm, I don't know how to describe it. Like, cause resistance was like, th- I feel like them just creating i think second law they st- kind of somewhere around the resistance second law drones thing um it's almost like their thing as a band changed so like <laughs> up until resistance i would say anger was behind a lot of their music and a lot of their sound and a lot of their tones i think as well once they got to the, like resistance second law drones era they still had that anger but they were exploring more, they'd grown up a bit. And so they were kind of exploring slightly different themes. And I think that actually some people had obviously fallen in love with that angry sound. Um, and so when they started doing things like follow me, like save me, um, and some of their lighter things. And also when they got to drones where yes, there's, that's probably their angriest album since, I don't know, absolution or something, but they they didn't feel angry when they were making it, so to speak. Like it felt very controlled and like, well, here's where we want the anger to really hit their peak. So if we do the symbol roll up to here, it will really work. And so it came, maybe they started treating albums a bit more clinically and maybe that's because they got so big after Resistance-ish and so they had to take it a bit more businessy clinically kind of thing. Mm. So a bit more formulaic. Almost, yeah. I think... Um, there may have been areas of extreme around like drones and the like, recording process of drones and this, particularly on second law where I feel like they may have held back whether from a production side or a mixing side um, because they knew that they now had half, like if not half, maybe like 30% of a fan base who just know them from the twilight movies. <laughs> and I think obviously being such a big band, I'm sure there'll be there'll be there'll have been people somewhere saying something like, "Well, you earn us a lot of money, so you can't lose money on this album." Like kind of thing. Someone will have said that to someone somewhere about Muse. And also to to carry on with that idea of like maybe it's a business thing, maybe it's a, a change in attitude towards making music. One of the biggest things that I think you can notice, and I think it happens earlier than when we're talking about like resistance second law era. I think it actually happens around, um, absolution, black holes and revolution, black holes and revelations, um, era. And that is, I think on showbiz and to an extent origin, they didn't quite know as much music theory, so to speak, because there are certain chords and certain, um, harmonic ideas in showbiz particularly that don't really make sense like from a music theory perspective and then as they get um further in i think they started to understand it a bit more particularly around black holes and revelations resistance time um and i think maybe that's also colored their their songwriting in in the more recent albums is not um a formulaic thing just a more and just a better understanding of how to achieve the sound they want to achieve so they don't stumble across weirder things every now and then. Interesting. A lot of their songs got more kind of like, you know, musically complex uh, after Absolution particularly. Um, 
I think not. I think some people might be a bit distracted by they were doing complex stuff from Origin. You know, look at the mad piano from Space Dementia. It's like, well, that's not that mad. That's just doing chords along an entire keyboard. It's it's more like it's more like you know the harmonies and the relationships between notes and, and instruments that got a lot more interesting. Mm. You know, let's uh, like let's look at you know the key changes in Knights of Sidonia. Is a good is a good example of that. The uh, the 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 circle of fifths in Take a Bow. Mm. Um, um, the 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 mesh the mashing up of like of um you know t- types of sound and production for supermassive black hole um, yeah f- uh, as well that's kind of really kind of showing that they've kind of matured like sonically they're taken the small amount of time between coming off of the tour from absolution to to releasing black holes that they you know they've really really pushed some stuff further and then i'd say that was compounded even more when we get to absolute um get to resistance i'm sure someone in the comments will be like oh well actually space dementia is as complicated as a rack symphony and it's like it's not necessarily complicated it's that as they got more confident with their musical theory and their understanding of songwriting their songs probably got more complicated, but sounded less complicated because they knew what they were doing. Like in Space Dementia, mm. you can hear that there's bare chromaticism going on. There's big key changes, not key changes, but like tonal shifts from like E minor to some of the kind of G major territories and stuff in the verses and in the choruses and stuff. And it's not to say that that stuff doesn't happen in more recent Muse. It's just hidden well because it's written in a way where it just flows more, and so you don't notice it as much. I agree with the, with what you're saying in terms of you know the, the you know the smooth transitions between between things. I mean, they were doing they'd done a, you know bits of that with um, Origin. You know the 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 change in with Bliss. You know it's, it's minor for the verse, but major in in the chorus, and it, it's a really you know normally like when you just do a, a minor major change on a guitar. Right, you can really hear that. It's night and day in terms of that sound. But to go, but from from the verse to to the chorus in Bliss, like it's such a seamless transition, and you can't really see it. That you can't really detect it that well. But when you get to later albums where they're doing way more complicated, complex stuff, kind of blows that kind of like little transition out of the water in terms of how complex it to, it can get. Like you know, they had elements of doing some of that clever stuff early on, but they really pushed it even further. Um, so the, I would, you know, maybe it's to the with the theme of, of what we're trying to talk about here in terms of you know Muse still hitting as hard as they can. I would say you know maybe that kind of is helping them not to feel as though they're hitting hard enough because it seems so easy, it seems so um, smooth um, that it with you know with you know with interesting compositions and crazy stuff that are. That it it's just kind of going over a lot of people's heads, you know. I would probably be guilty of that a little bit because um, you just think you just you don't notice. You notice it when you sit down to actually learn how to play that song, and then you realise, hang on, this this note now works. It was a it was a duff note four bars ago, but now it works. That sort of thing. It's like mm. oh, there's a key change there, and it's like a really subtle key change. It was like when we were dis- dissecting the album, I was like. There was that one song of like, how many key changes are in this? Four, five, one, two, a million. And it was like, well, it's like this kind of like almost this half key change that you that you'd spoken about. Like, oh, oh shit! Yeah, yeah, that reminds me. Yeah, because they are, the, yeah. Uh, uh, and it was, and it, and it was like, oh, that's 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 interesting. It's really good. Mm. I mean, um, uh, yeah. I think I, I, I keep alluding to kind of like the actual main discussion for this by saying I think maybe maybe we should just go into it unless we want to cover. Simulation theory? No, no I think with, the less said about that one, the better, really. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think one point to kind of just, to, which probably brings us on to the current album, the current touring, and the current reaction to Muse is um, something I noticed when I saw them at the Isle of Wight Festival. Is uh, on the Sunday, absolutely everyone I saw wearing a Muse T-shirt was in their thirties or older. And so maybe it's just a thing that Muse aren't popular with the kids anymore. It was very popular. They had their time with Twilight and now... <laughs> well, now the people who like Twilight, you know, are in their mid-twenties. Yeah. And it's like, you know, you can't, can't stay down with the kids for too long. So they've not done, um, they've not like, done a bad job, to be fair, because they're not super cringe, but they are a bit, like, bit kind of boomery now. <laughs> yeah. 
Although technically they aren't more. Um, when did the baby boom end? I hate the term boomer because it's just it's thrown out so much that it's like so ill informed in terms of they're what like, is a the boomer. Muse are definitely. Um, I think they're no, they wouldn't be millennials. They're Gen Z. Or, no, Gen not Gen Z. Gen X. That's the one. Gen X. <laughs> yeah. Um, they were born in late seventies, so yeah, yeah, that's Gen X, I think. Yeah. So they're um, not, yeah, they're not, they're not boomers. It's it's like, yeah, but they've got like they have like you know cringe energy, but they kind of usually they ride it really well. Um, it's it's more like I mean, this one probably mm. doesn't even matter. This one doesn't make sense because um, I'm going to make a comment on like their social media. They do not run their own social media. Anyone mm. with eyes can tell that no one from the band runs their own social media. They have a marketing agency that does it for them. You know, uh, which is plain to see. Uh, recently, we are recording this on the 19th of October. Two days ago, yesterday or something, they put on two videos on their story of two females. Ah, uh, I knew who, this was going to come who, up. <laughs> who, dressed, who dressed up for Halloween using, the, using the, the Halloween song. And it was just like, they put it on mm. there to, oh, we're, like, we're so relatable with the, with the children. Um, but it's like, n- yeah. I don't, I don't think so. I think this, the fact that you've got a song with the word Halloween in it, mm. that sounds like a Halloween song and it's October. Mm. I think that's why they're using this song to make these TikToks. Mm. And it's like, it's, I, I, it's, I, I, I don't know if they know that we know <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> sort of thing. Is that especially with things like that and Matt Bellamy and Muse being into things like NFTs and stuff? I'm just a bit like, I oh, don't even on, get man. me started. Come on, <laughs> like, let's not let's not do that. Let's, let's not let's music. not talk about NFTs. It was so such a bad choice. Mm-hmm. And it, I think crypto, well, cryptocurrencies are just are oh, so friggin' dangerous and really bad. I'm so mm. anti and like NFTs and stuff like that. It's like pointless. Yeah. Here's a picture that's worth sixty thousand dollars. Copy paste. Yeah, literally. It's it's. I I think it will probably come back in a more refined, sensible way. But at the moment, I think it is just a big con. And I think if you're in it and you haven't managed to, oh god, absolutely, work out that it's a con, you're getting conned, kind of thing. Like, yeah, like you can make money from Bitcoin. Not from from cryptocurrencies, but you know, most of people people who've made their money already have already made their yeah, money, and the exactly. rest of it is just a scam to bring people in. Like that ship has sailed. It's it's mm. more of a fad and a fashion statement, really. I think than a than a business model now. I think. Yeah, um, I think like, so. God, I think some of the... I almost think that's why Matt Bellamy's into it, like, because oh, oh. he is Ugh. he is kind of weirdly concerned with fashion. Like he always used to be like, I'm just going to wear some weird shit on stage. But now, since he became LA-ified, um, he's definitely lent a bit more into like, oh, well, I'll wear some really fancy shit. And what about this shit as well? And these sunglasses, they're Gucci, but I'm just going to wear them mm. for a sound check in a video. Ha 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 ha. The, the audience is aging. Mm-hmm. They're, not, they're not staying relevant. Again, that may speak very much to the whole, you know, they're not hitting as hard as they used to. You know, when they hit hard, that can help them get a new audience, I think sticking to what they that what they can do i.e. doing a best of is going to retain that audience you've been mm. like oh right we're back on course we've had a few weird albums this is some classic muse that's going to like give confidence in the market let's trust no wait sorry that's going to give confidence <laughs> to the audience um sorry i had to do that joke had to do that joke uh, could it, you know to re- re- reassure the audience of like all oh, right they're still they they still got it mm. um I think they're so far removed. I mean, not to be so redactive as to say it's just because they're older now, mm. but I think there's something in that. You know, there's only there's only yeah. there's only so many so many ways you can turn your hat sideways until you people realise that you you know you're in your mid forties. <laughs> yeah, and I think I think well, purely the fact that when I got into Muse, they were already a ten year old band. I was fifteen, and so they still had something to say that was attractive to a fifteen year old. Now, that's 10 years ago. That's so horrible. Um, more than 10 years ago, really. It's like 14 years ago kind of thing. And so now I'm like, well, what do they have? It's even longer for me. Yeah, it's like, what's the relevancy that they've got for someone who's 12 <laughs> to 15 now? Like, 
people who are 12 to 15 now just care about TikTok and pronouns. I <laughs> keep that in because that's a really good joke. And I hope oh. people know that I'm just joking there. But like they don't, they're, they're into completely different music and completely different messages from said music. So why mm. would they be interested in a bunch of 40 year old men from Britain who were <laughs> kind of big in the noughties? Like, you know what I mean? It's effectively like... It would be like our parents when we were five telling us, listen to Duran Duran, they're really, really good. And it's like, yeah, they might be, but they've got nothing to say to me at that age in that generation. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, 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 it's a phenomenon not unique to them. It's a phenomenon that is just life. Um, mm. I would then, I th- you might agree with this, then I guess the way that they seem to be kind of like chasing it, and by when I say they, I mean, you know, the wizards, I mean bands music the industry it's mm. just because of capitalism they're like we need to make new ground we need to make new mar- new market um I, and it's just a bit it's it's it makes me a bit cynical and kind of makes me kind of step away outside of it and go oh god the music industry is awful mm-hmm. i i genuinely believe the music industry is awful is in music industry is awful after a certain scale when it gets like to massive massive bands it's like mm. it's just it's like yeah do you know formulaic and just kind of don't try anything new and it's got to be massive and then you know, the really this the really great appealing thing for like true indie music where it's just like it is just four or five people in a studio doing music that they actually enjoy mm. making making barely enough to make ends meet but like that's real music yeah you and could I could say I think you're right to an extent about the capitalism aspect of big bands i don't know this for certain but judging just from the way that muse spoke about their approach to will of the people it sounds like someone can still tell them what to do when it comes to an album which from a musician's perspective makes no sense whatsoever because they've absolutely proved themselves to be able to make money so surely at this point they should be able to just go now we're going to do this and maybe they can still do that and it was just a suggestion but something about the way they talk about certain things makes me think event at some point there is someone at Warner Brothers or somewhere who goes, mm, not sure about that one, guys. I'm not I'm not so sure it's like that because well they their own production company is theirs, isn't it? So really they do call the shots. Yeah. My point with that is more like it's just them looking at, you know, at the at their finances, the returns, you know, looking yeah. at trends themselves and making it self imposed. Uh, I think really it's kind of like splitting hairs if it's really themselves saying do it like this or if it's like you know y- you know generic fat cat saying do it like this yeah I think yeah. that doesn't re- that doesn't really matter it's it's just the market the trend saying this works do you know try this mm. and it's like don't like and maybe and that's maybe that's of- why they're they're not hitting as hard because I don't necessarily know if that idea is popular in the industry anymore i think i think obviously at the very top ends like muse like ariana grande like whoever um that model is still pursued but i think for the new wave of artists coming up i think it's all about the artist doing whatever the fuck they want like that whole idea of a label controlling someone is so unpopular now yeah well because they're all tiktok musicians Mm. aren't they Mm. so it's like they which is really let's let's strip it down let's let's remove the awful horribleness that is tiktok but then just say that's what music's supposed to be an honest Mm. like piece of art by an individual and it not doesn't necessarily mean they have to then do a career where they make a living out of it you can have a fantastically written song by someone who writes just that one song Mm. And it's like, that's really what music is, doesn't matter who you are. You can write a, a kick-ass piece of music. Um, it, it, you get away from the glamorization of, you know, the industry where it's, where it's, you know, really expensive and everyone's larger than life. It's, no, it can be, you know, Dave from the shop mm. on a ukulele in a triangle. <laughs> Yeah, and, and if- you know, wearing, wearing wearing socks on his hands, and so yeah, I think in in this day and age where we're kind of seeing more and more kind of ideas of where music can come from, I don't really, I don't think music hitting as hard as they had previously done, or really what you would imagine that they would be doing these days. But then again, in a way, you could say most bands aren't hitting as hard as they need to because there is so much out there. Mm. Again, which is then I would, you could then argue that is the fault of capitalism because capitalism thrives on um 
competitive no, competition weirdly like com- capitalism loves diversity yeah actually that's quite funny. you you wouldn't you wouldn't look at it you wouldn't know it by looking at the people who sit in the top of capitalism mm. but um capitalism loves diversity with more and more diverse things out there in the market it, things all kind of like be pushed out kind of to the peripheral mm. to so the point like where a, you could it's like a blessing and a curse almost because there's infinite yeah. music but if there's infinite music, there isn't infinite money, so not everyone's getting paid the way they should get paid for being out there kind of thing. There's no money tree. <laughs> well, there, there is. You just get It's just in Panama. Um, <laughs> <laughs> costs too much to import it. Um, so I think... I, I think so let me let me ask you a question then, mm. um, which I think is going to be you know, like you know maybe the the big point for this particular podcast. When we released, when we did the album review, we really liked it. You know, I was saying this was like you know top four album for me. Mm. Um, uh, do you remember where you placed this album in your kind of like? I think- was it high? Was it low? I think I was saying stuff like it kind of rivals. Um, uh, no, I don't know if I said it right. If, if it takes the resistance spot for me, or if it was that mm-hmm. I just really enjoyed some of the attitudes behind it, and it made me feel a bit like the resistance. Either way, it would definitely be in my top four, like if not top yeah three. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, so with that in mind, let me ask you this question: mm. Are you still listening to it? Yes, I am actually. Okay. Um, particularly in full um i haven't done a full album listen for a while but i'm still listening to tracks from both halves but i do prefer the second half to listen to um okay and i've been listening to you make me feel like halloween a lot because it's october (laughs) and it's halloween so um that's been fun (laughs) um but i tell you what i've actually been listening to more of is the footage from their live shows they've been doing recently. Okay, talk to me. Talk to me about that then. So, I mean, their set lists have been brilliant. Um, I don't know if this is. Ca- I think these are their intimate shows that they're doing, but they're the ones in America, so they're in like theaters and stuff. So, God knows if the set lists will be anywhere near as good for their actual main tour. But like, Space Dementia's been a regular. They've alternated Stockholm and Newborn on set lists. They've had Assassin Grand Omega Bosses edit. Um, mm. What else have they been doing? They've alternated between Will of the People and We Are Fucking Fucked as the opener, which I think is awesome. I um, think they've always played Won't Stand Down in a set. And they're closing yeah. with... Uh, well, they've got Halloween in every set, which is awesome. And I think they're still closing with Nights. But... Um, Oh, and they do Kill or Be Killed as the encore first track, which I think is brilliant. Um, so I think, yeah, I think, I don't know. And also, like, because Will of the People is like a heavier album with the metal stuff, I think they're just having more fun on stage again because it's like drones, but I feel like the riffs are of better quality on Will of the People. Yeah. No, yeah, I, I, I like that observation. Um, I th- you, well, I had my biggest criticism of, of simulation theory. Was the live shows were just copy and paste because mm. they they had the, they had those dancers that had learned those routines. Yeah. That means you know they'd pay they'd pay for them. We have to use them, which means we have to do the same set for a year and a half. And it was like that was tedious. Mm. I the, the dancers were my were the worst thing about the simulation tour. Yeah, it was I think. Much. Yeah, the set. I think the set list that they that they're running at the moment. I think they go in themes with like you know they've got the the theatre set the thin mm. like skeleton because they're playing you know things like minimum. Oh shit! Yeah, niche. I forgot about that. Yeah, um, it, which is which is great, but they weren't doing it for like the the big like um, like festival shows or arena shows. They've definitely got those kind of like we, types of. We did get the gallery shows. on the festival shows. To be fair, ah, oh, oh, that's good. That's good. I love you know you want to get a get a deep cut. Um, it's it's it. Yes, they're doing all those things. You know, they're alternating with will the people or fucking fucked. Alternating noob on Stockholm syndrome and with nights, which is still a really good strong one. I think people are a bit bored by nights, but I think it's still a great song. Probably mm. one of their one of their finer set closers. Um, but they're still for me. They're still unfortunately playing badness, starlight. Mm. Um. And it's like drop them. I say. I think. I think they've 
finally stopped playing Pressure? Or are they still kind of limping it along a little bit? I haven't seen Pressure. And actually, I haven't seen Uprising. As much as I don't mind Uprising being in the set, I haven't seen that in the set recently. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be sad if that stopped. Yeah, I wouldn't um, mind either. I think with the new stuff, they've actually got better Resistance-style songs, as in Uprising, yeah. Fight the Power kind of thing. Yeah, I think, well, I think, well this is the yeah, really pedantic. I think the um, thing that I don't like about, like, Uprising and Starlight is that Matt doesn't play guitar live. He goes into the audience and kind of gets in there. You know, mm. nice for him, but it's like, we can't, like, it It feels so weird. When they could play a song I, where he's riffing the fuck out, then it's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't get it. It doesn't sit right with me. So, uh, that, so I, I like that. But, um, uh, so having that variety in there is so good. And what I, one thing I really like, I don't know if you've picked up on this, is that he's changing up with the guitar he's using for Supermassive Black Hole. Uh, it, as, as someone who's into music and someone who's really into tech and instruments and so on, you'll notice that mm. he has, they've, you know, he's always had like, you know, this guitar is for this song on this tour mm. like and it never ever ever changes really yeah, yeah like yeah. it might change here or there but he's played um supermassive black hole with his um like tremlock um gu- guitar or like one without a chaos pad and oh. it's like he's really experimenting with it by not just making it just be a chaos pad yeah um i think he's like you know he's going back to like you know a natural guitar solo who's playing strings on the guitar and it's like <laughs> Is it, which I would say is like, how old yes, school. they are having, <laughs> they, yeah, how how revolutionary a guitar solo, like, yeah. but like, it's 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 showing. I think I agree with you in that they are having fun with it. Mm. Um, no, to just to dip back into the theme again of like, are they still hitting hard? Maybe the album is just kind of they're doing what they want, you know, with 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 the album for whatever. But they're, I think, the energy that they've kind of saved on that, they're really kind of going into the live shows, which maybe they know that's where mm. they play best. And they're just really Possible. going in that by just putting on a on a good effort for that. I mean, we can only speculate on this, but I think it, comparing it to Simulation Theory, where it was very much you know copy paste, it, you could have been on any show, hit, give or take, with some um, examples. The Tom Morello one with Break Break It. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Um, or, or, but it's like it's very rigid. It's it's it wasn't going to change, and we've got so much variety and nuance with these set lists. It's that's 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 some great playing from them mm. and and commercially that's not really being seen by you know joe public really you know if who really cares about what the average person thinks and when you're going to talk about something specific like this it's something to it's i guess it's something to sort of bear in mind but it kind of really is up to kind of the beholder i think that they really need to keep going with this whole variety in the set lists mm. well they could so when it they they must know. I mean, they definitely know that people, depending on the country and the venue size, etc., that they could literally play a set of like minimum Nature One, uh, Shrinking Universe, Dead Star, Recess, and people would still love it and probably sing along to everything still. Um, I guess it's, I guess, I don't know, I guess it, maybe it comes down to that thing again of like, who are they, What what's the best model for them to continue? Should they try and attract new fans and therefore play stuff that's like Madness, Supermassive Black Hole, Uprising that people might have heard on an advert or something and then listen to them and then stick around for their newer stuff? Or do they just appeal to the fan base that they've got now and just try and be the best version of themselves for them? It's tricky. It's it's tricky. I think if we go off of what the Will of the People album represents, it's you know you know as we've said you know a best of, mm. and what they're doing live by playing things or playing around with things. I would say that maybe they have just gone down the hole. Um, right, we're just going to do we're going to do what we what we like, but also kind of what the fans want. You know, best of stuff. Playing around with uh, deep cut live because we've kind of we've really kind of dialed in. We've recognised our, our our audience is aging. Because mm. <laughs> um, I saw in an interview that Matt said, like, you know, when they were doing the Twilight stuff, they were seeing loads of, like, teenage girls in the front row of shows, and then that started to fade away. It's like, you know, they've gone back to, you know, 30-year-old men. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> hi, hi. I'm nearly um, there. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Well, no, I am there. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were... Uh, Look at so, you, um, grown up. It, it, 
Oh, so old. <laughs> so old, so alone. Um, uh, it, 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 maybe it does represent that that's, that's the way they're going to go. And maybe they will hit hard once again. I mean, but, I mean it's, it's, it's very hard to say I mean, with, when comparing it to just leaving, the pre- sorry, the previous album being Simulation Theory and this one being Will of the People. It's, it's, it's difficult to say. I, uh, I want to take some time to answer my own question. Mm. Earlier, which is, you know, am I listening to the album? I am not. Interesting. I'm listening to the odd song here and there, but like when I'm just hanging out or if I'm playing guitar, I'm not listening to the whole album in full. Mm. Um, which is interesting because it's like, I still think it's like well up there for me, but nothing is drawing me to want to listen to it. Like I'm going to like Origin and Absolution a lot more than I would do, but even then I'm not, list- not listening to the album in full. Um, but nothing is driving me to want to listen to a considerable number of those songs in one sitting in one go in, in the, in, in the proper order or what have you. Mm. Um, and I think it, that's what made me want to kind of do this particular show with you. Like, are they hitting as hard as they can or are we kind of taking them for granted? Mm. I said that in a very strange way. Um, but it, uh, it, it's, it's interesting because it, you know, I'm a big fan, and I love them, but nothing is, nothing, there's no voice in my head going, listen to it, listen to it, go do it, do it. Nothing is doing that. I'm, I'm listening to other bands, I'm listening to other artists. Mm. Like at the moment, I'm listening to Ghostly Kisses, I'm listening to French 79, Lanterns on the Lake, I'm listening to Phoenix, that's two French yeah. groups. Um uh, uh, yeah, like I'm listening to those a lot more, which have got much more of like a, an indie sound, apart from French right now, which is more electronic. But um, I'm listening to those, like it's drawing me a lot more to them. Because, well, I guess one, a lot of the music from them I've you know le- not listened to previously. Um, but is this is this is this signs of things to come to say maybe maybe the sun is setting on music? I think it's we're getting to the point where they're like Rolling Stones and Queen and all those bands. And it's like, they're still going to create music. But I mean, what was the last Rolling Stones album that you could remember that wasn't from the sixties or early seventies? Like they've definitely (laughs) released some, but I don't know what the fuck they are. Like, um, I think was that one with the gorilla on it. (laughs) Maybe, but I think Muse (laughs) are just hitting that phase where maybe in 10 years time they'll put an album on everyone's iPhone and everyone will really hate them for a bit but otherwise they'll keep going like I think that's where Muse are at I think they've I don't think they're ever gonna fade into obscurity um but I think maybe maybe the conclusion to this entire podcast about whether Muse are getting worse better not hitting as hard whether we're listening to other music or whatever the simple answer is everyone's just getting fucking older and changing. On that cold <laughs> taste Merry of Christmas, reality, everyone, and <laughs> happy Halloween. <laughs> See you in the grave. Um, oh my goodness! I probably would have said the exact same thing. You'd probably just beat me to the punch uh, on, on that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, everyone's just getting old. Everything changes. Nothing stays the same. It's just, it's just life. And let's maybe, maybe we could um, talk some sense in some, into some people. At the end of the day, it is just a band. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm see, looking at you, angry people in the comments yeah. on the Muses group. Like, no, Muses are going to be big forever. It's like, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Or the or you get you get them or you get the ones who are like, no, nah, music been shit since Origin of Symmetry. It's like, okay, cool, nice, nice. Like, mm. Everyone's got an opinion. <laughs> everyone's, got, everyone's got everyone's got an opinion. Everyone's getting old. Thank you for that. That was r- insightful. Mm. Yeah, it raises some interesting questions. But time will only tell mm. what happens with a with a lot of what you said. We will have to wait ten years to see if any of that happens. Yeah, exactly. Uh, a challenge, a challenge. I will uh, hang around for. Uh, that'll make me really old by the time that comes around. Oh, God, um, imagine. Or maybe I'll be dead. <laughs> I'm, not that, I'm not that old. <laughs> well, maybe, it's just, maybe the nuclear war will happen and the famines will happen and the ice caps will melt and we will all be dead in 10 years. So who knows? <laughs> uh, brilliant. <laughs> uh, Matt, where can people find you? Uh, you can find me at Jazzboyfuckike on TM. 
on Instagram. I think it's the same on YouTube or maybe just take the TM off. Um, I've not actually done anything on YouTube or Instagram for a little while. Um, I am writing a script for the phase 95, why you should buy that as opposed to the phase 100 or the phase 90. Um, Ooh, doing, oh, to rival my review yeah, of the yeah, phase nine. Yeah. Mm, um, and I'm also doing a big, big review or big feature type thing on the slow distortion that I got recently because it's probably the best distortion pedal that was ever made. And people are just too dumb when it comes to EQ that they don't understand how it works. But anyway. I'd be very interested <laughs> to see that. That sounds very exciting. Mm, so I'm very excited um, for it. I'm just looking at it now on my pedal board like, hmm. Ooh. <laughs> uh, uh, great. Uh, you can find me, Harry Chris Robin, on pretty much everything on YouTube, Instagram. Are the main things? Well, thank you for joining me as always, Matt. Um, hopefully, we will be regular with this podcast once again. Indeed. Um, I like my bowels. Yeah, I would very much like to have regular content on this to have more discussions on music moving forward where we hopefully we'll break out from Muse. I'm thinking something on Coins of the Stone Age in the future. Um, for anyone who is still listening at this point, we, uh, Matt and I did do a did do a podcast on Tom Morello because we t- we'd said that we were going to do it. We recorded it and realised the entire thing was wank. Yes. <laughs> uh, and so that podcast will never, ever see the light of day. Um, I think there's about a grand total of about seven or eight minutes where we actually talk about something vaguely interesting, but seven or eight minutes a podcast doth not make. Yeah, it's just um, us ranting about the state of the world and all the fucking I'm ranting about c- how communism is really bad. Yeah, it gets quite dark, doesn't it? <laughs> it got really, it got so bad. Uh, anyway, well, uh, I've been Harry, Chris Robin. I've been Jazz Boy Fuck Icon. And thanks for listening. Thank you very much.